with the sixth commandment, we're now well on our way through the second table of God's law. It should be becoming more and more apparent that God gives these laws for our good. They protect us, and they protect other people from us. The fourth commandment protects the authority of God's representatives in the home and government and church. The fifth commandment protects God's gift of life. A person's life is the time God gives a person to come to faith in Jesus, and no one has the right to decide when that time should end but God alone. The sixth commandment, you shall not commit adultery, protects God's gift of marriage. God loves marriage and family because he brings great blessing through them. The devil and our own sinfulness work very hard to destroy marriage and family. You shall not commit adultery. It protects God's gift of marriage. So first let's talk about what marriage is. We'll use this picture to help us. Marriage isn't a human institution. It doesn't exist because some random people a long time ago decided maybe it would be a good idea if men and women picked partners that they stayed with for the rest of their lives and had kids together. No, marriage wasn't started by people. It's a divine institution. It was God's idea. And he started it at the very beginning with the very first people. Genesis chapter 2 tells us how God created Adam out of the dust of the ground and Eve out of Adam's rib. On the same day that he created them, they got married. And once they were married, God gave a definition of marriage. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and they will become one flesh. A marriage involves two people, a man and a woman. When they get married, their relationship with their parents changes. Their parents are still their parents, but they aren't their closest relationship anymore. Now their closest relationship is with each other. It's so close, in fact, that God calls the husband and wife one flesh. In marriage, the rules of math are thrown out the window, and one plus one equals one. So here's God's definition of marriage. A lifelong union between one man and one woman. Sometimes people say that marriage is supposed to be forever. And if Adam and Eve hadn't sinned in the Garden of Eden, that would have been the case, because neither one of them would ever have died. But now that people die, God says that death ends a marriage. A married woman is bound to her husband as long as he is alive, but if her husband dies, she is released from the law of marriage. So in this example, the husband dies first. Once he dies, his wife isn't married to him anymore and is free to marry someone else if she chooses. When a bride and groom make their wedding vows, they promise to be faithful to each other till death do us part, which is an old way of saying until death parts us. Sometimes the language is modernized, as long as we both shall live. So marriage isn't forever. It only lasts as long as both husband and wife are alive. Now we're going to talk about three blessings that God gives through marriage. First, companionship. When you're married, your spouse isn't your only companion, but your spouse is your closest companion. As we've already seen in God's definition of marriage in Genesis, you and your spouse are one flesh. Marriage is the closest, most intimate relationship in the world. The second blessing God gives through marriage is children. The third is sexual happiness. These three special blessings all belong to marriage. It is inside of marriage, not outside of marriage, that God intends these blessings to be enjoyed. When God created Adam and Eve, the first job he gave them was to have children. This job wasn't given to them to be a burden, but a blessing. And it was only by God's blessing that they could have children. Our society seems to treasure things more than children. Often people don't have kids or have fewer kids, because kids cost a lot of time and money, and people want to spend their time and money on stuff besides kids. That's backwards. Children are a blessing, not a burden. Some husbands and wives aren't able to have kids. When they are able, that is a gift for which they can thank God, that God would entrust the care of something so precious to them. The third blessing God gives through marriage is sexual happiness. Sex isn't a bad thing or a dirty thing. It's a good thing, a gift from God to be enjoyed by a husband and wife. Like all good gifts that God gives, however, sex can be abused, and often it is. Whenever sex is used outside of a marriage of one man and one woman, it is abused and turned into something sinful and dirty. 
We live in a society where sex outside of marriage is glorified and defended to such an extent that many people don't even realize that sex outside of marriage is sinful. But there's absolutely no question about God's position on sex outside of marriage. Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Do you not know that the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor male prostitutes, nor homosexual offenders, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Notice how many of these sins that God calls wickedness are sexual sins. Sexually immoral, adulterers, male prostitutes, homosexual offenders. All of these are perversions of God's gift of sex because they take place outside of God's institution of marriage, and God says that these people will not go to heaven. We can illustrate this passage like this. Sexual immorality, adultery, homosexuality are all wrong because they are outside of marriage. God's threat against people who practice such things isn't an empty threat. You can see how seriously God takes marriage and how vigorously he protects it. We might identify that list of sexual sins in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 with actions. Sexual immorality, adultery, homosexuality. Those may all strike us as things that people do with their bodies, and often they are. But sexual sins don't always take two people. We can also commit them in our hearts and minds and thoughts. Jesus once commented on the Sixth Commandment, You have heard that it was said, Do not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Jesus says it's not just sleeping with someone you're not married to that's sinful. It's wanting to. This is especially important to keep in mind in our society where sexually provocative images are all over the place. On TV, in movies, on the internet, in magazines, billboards, everywhere. They say sex sells, and they're right. And we're surrounded by sexual immorality so much that it might not even strike us as sinful anymore. We're going to take a moment now to define some terms of different sexual sins. Sexual immorality is a general term for actions or thoughts or desires that abuse God's gift of sex. All of the terms that follow will fit into the category of sexual immorality. Pornography is sexually immoral words or images that are meant to provoke lustful thoughts. Pornography is commonly in magazines and it's all over the internet. Premarital sex refers to engaging in sexual relations to someone before you marry them. It's common for a boyfriend and girlfriend to move in together now and have sex with each other before they are married. Someone might defend that practice by saying, they're going to get married eventually, but that is still a sin because it is using sex outside of marriage. Just because it's common doesn't mean it's right. Adultery specifically refers to someone who is married that cheats on their spouse with someone else. Homosexuality is engaging in sexual activity with someone that's the same gender that you are. Homosexuality has become increasingly defended as normal and good over about the past 20 years. Many churches even defend it, even though the Bible specifically condemns it as a sin. Same-sex marriage, where a man marries another man or a woman marries another woman, has been legalized in many other countries and also in many states in the United States. But homosexuality is wrong whether or not the couple is married because marriage is a, is a union between one man and one woman. Divorce is another area where our culture has gone further and further away from God's word. Divorce is the ending of a marriage for a reason other than death. Remember that marriage is a lifelong union between one man and one woman. A couple promises to be faithful to one another as husband and wife till death do us part as long as we both shall live. Divorce ends a marriage prematurely. God says that he hates divorce. In fact, Jesus says, I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for marital unfaithfulness and marries another woman commits adultery. If a marriage isn't going well, the solution isn't to end the marriage. It's to fix the people in the marriage. 
But notice Jesus does cite an example where he allows divorce. In Matthew 19, he says, except for marital unfaithfulness. In a case where one spouse cheats on the other, commits adultery, God doesn't say there has to be a divorce, but he does allow the spouse who was cheated on to file for divorce if he or she chooses because of the great damage the adultery has inflicted on the marriage. Another passage which speaks about a circumstance where God allows for divorce is 1 Corinthians 7. Speaking to a Christian whose unbelieving spouse leaves the marriage, God says, If the unbeliever leaves, let him do so. A believing man or woman is not bound in such circumstances. God has called us to live in peace. When one spouse makes the marriage completely impossible to carry out anymore, whether by maliciously leaving or by making it a dangerous place for the spouse or children by abuse, then in that instance God also permits divorce. The terms most often used to refer to these two circumstances are marital unfaithfulness and malicious desertion. All of this talk about how people break the Sixth Commandment is necessary because people have found so many different ways to break it. And because we're so accustomed to these sins, God's commandment about adultery may even seem to us like God is just trying to keep good and pleasurable things away from us, like he's depriving us. But God doesn't give us laws to keep good things away from us. All of his commandments, including the Sixth, are given to keep us away from evil, harmful things. Our culture glorifies sex outside of marriage. But in reality, sex outside of marriage ruins marriages and families. Sexual immorality, adultery, premarital sex, divorce, homosexuality, pornography, all such sins attack and destroy God's institution of marriage and family. And they also attack the people inside of it. At the same time that our society celebrates all these things, households are ruined by them. Children are scarred. People no longer know what it means to be loved. And the home is no longer a place of refuge where people see the love of God in action and learn the love of Jesus. Many homes have become a whole lot more like a miserable battleground. God gives the sixth commandment for our good to protect marriage and family. It protects us. And that brings up one last major requirement of the Sixth Commandment that is captured so well in the explanation. It's not just that we lead a pure and decent life and not commit sexual immorality, but also that husband and wife love and honor each other. So many marriages are miserable because spouses get angry with each other and turn into enemies. They fight and they don't forgive, and as a result, the home collapses. That can be awful for everyone involved. But when a husband and wife love and honor each other, the home will be a wonderful place of refuge where the love of Jesus is modeled and taught and passed on to the next generation. In Ephesians chapter 5, God compares the relationship between a husband and wife to the relationship between Jesus and Christians. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church, and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church, without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. When a husband and wife carry out their God-given roles and respect and love and forgive one another, God's gift of marriage and family will be full of blessing. Before we wrap up our study of the Sixth Commandment, I'd like to return briefly to the passage in 1 Corinthians 6, where God so strongly condemns sexual immorality as wickedness and says that people who engage in it will not go to heaven. Of course, God means every word of this, and it is not to be taken lightly. But it's also not all that God says. The passage goes on. The Apostle Paul wrote these words to Christians who hadn't always been Christians. They had once been godless and immoral, and sexual sins had been some of their favorite sins. 
But notice what he says here. That list of wickedness, he doesn't say that's what you are. He says that's what you were. Certainly they had had a difficult time leaving that lifestyle, and even more certainly they faced temptations to go back to it. And certainly they still fell into such sins, even as Christians. But still Paul writes, that's what you were. Even though you may still fall into sin, that's not what you are anymore. What changed them? God changed them. You were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. When we study the Sixth Commandment, and all the commandments for that matter, we see our own sinfulness all over the place. But God reminds us as Christians, You were baptized. Your sins are forgiven. You're God's child now. And that's what gives us peace. Not that we've kept God's commandments perfectly, but that Jesus kept them for us, and he's washed away our sins with his blood. You're going to heaven, not because you've obeyed, but because Jesus forgives you. And your strength and desire to obey the sixth commandment comes from his forgiveness. A wonderful thing to remember when we're tempted. That's not who I am, because God has forgiven me. So the sixth commandment protects God's gift of marriage and family. Through the lifelong union of one man and one woman, God provides for loving companionship, children, and sexual happiness. He has forgiven our disobedience, and he blesses us through our obedience.